let us begin today's lecture. So, what did we do yesterday? Where, where did we stop? We were discussing improper integrals of the first kind, right? The range of integration is from a to infinity, and we talked about what is the uh, convergence of improper integrals, conditional convergence, absolute convergence, and we proved that absolute convergence implies convergence. That is right, and we also saw the Cauchy's principle of convergence. We have a Cauchy's principle of convergence adapted to improper integrals. Correct? We saw that, and we proved one big theorem that integral 0 to infinity sin x upon x dx is conditionally convergent right integral we went we took integral from convenience we took it from 1 to infinity the same thing does not matter because from 0 to 1 the integral is a proper Riemann integral nothing more need be said about it. So, integral from 1 to infinity sin x upon x dx is conditionally convergent and that was a, a, a delicate analysis right because it we use the divergence of the harmonic series okay so let us continue further and let us prove a com, let us look at comparison tests and, and other things so tests for absolute convergence <coughs> the comparison test so suppose f and g are riemann integrable on the closed interval at for every t bigger than a just try to understand what the statement is trying to say. You do not have to write, write each and everything down. And what is given to you that mod f t less than or equal to mod g t. We express this by saying that g dominates f. g dominates f that is mod f less than or equal to mod g. And the dominant integral, integral a to infinity mod g converges, that is the assumption. Then the smaller one, integral mod f from a to infinity also converges. Likewise, if the smaller one diverges, the larger one must diverge, that is the comparison test. So, you are comparing two different integrals. Exactly as you do a comparison, as you have a comparison test for infinite series. You discuss comparison tests for infinite series, there is a corresponding comparison test for improper integrals. And the reason why there is this analogy is that both of them simply depend upon the Cauchy's principle of convergence, that is all, and nothing more that is involved. The proof of either of them uses the Cauchy criterion for convergence, otherwise, it is parallel except that for the integral you have to use the integral version of the Cauchy, Cauchy criterion and for series it is the uh, sequential version of the Cauchy criterion right? that is it. The, the appropriate version of the Cauchy's criterion has to be used for proving. There is nothing else uh, besides that and I am leaving the proof for you to uh, do work out. Okay? So, we have forgotten the proof of the comparison test for infinite series, just look up the proof of the infinite series and try to imitate the same proof, it will work. Right? Now, as in the case of an infinite series, uh, for the in improper integrals, there is a, a slight variant of the comparison test. The variant is called the limit comparison test. The limit compare you have a limit comparison test for infinite series, there is a limit comparison test for improper integrals. And you reduce this problem to the previous one, you reduce this to the com comparison test. Right? So, what does the limit comparison test tell you? It says that suppose you have two functions f and g. Again, the blanket assumption is that f and g are both Riemann integrable over uh, the closed interval a to t for every t bigger than a this hypothesis stays. Okay. So, now you have limit as t tends to infinity mod f t by g t. This limit exists and is not 0. Then 
the improper integrals a to infinity mod f t d t and uh, improper integral a to infinity mod g t d t behave alike. That is they will both converge or they will both diverge. And how does the proof go? Well, the limit exists, call it L, L is not equal to 0, so L by 2 is not 0. Take your epsilon to be L by 2, the definition of a limit. There is an epsilon, right? Given any epsilon greater than 0, there is a T naught such that all, all those things. So, take the epsilon to be L by 2. Then there is a B uh, bigger than A such that L by 2 less than mod F T by G T less than 3 by 2 L for all T bigger than or equal to B. Now, you simply use the usual comparison test that we have done. And the job is done. Is it okay? The limit comparison test for improper integrals. Tutorial 5. Discuss the convergence of integral 1 to infinity dx upon x to the power alpha, right. Discuss the convergence of integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus t into t to the power a dt. You can assume a positive. You can assume a is positive. So, discuss this. Third problem, just write discuss the for convergence the following, you know, this short circuit the writing, right. Discuss the convergence of integral minus infinity to plus infinity sin x upon sin x dx. What is sin x? Sin hyperbolic x, what is the definition? Half e to the power x minus e to the power minus x sin x upon sin x. Now, what happens at the, at the origin? What happens at the origin is the integrand continuous sin x is also 0, sin x is also 0. So, 0 by 0 form use L'Hopital's rule the limit exists and what is the limit? 1. So, origin is a nice point there nothing there is no bad behavior at the origin. Okay. Define sin x upon sin x to be 1 at the origin, right. You are talking about integrals. So, at one single point you can define, you can redefine the function if need be. So, define the integrand to be 1 at the origin, so that becomes a continuous function, all right. Discuss the convergence of minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus x squared. Are you familiar with this? Integral minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus x squared. What is it? Gamma function, gamma of half. What is the value? Root pi. Okay. Answer is root pi, but that is not going to prove the convergence. Huh? I just, I want the convergence, first the convergence and then discussion of the values. You have to still discuss the convergence. You cannot just say, well, it is gamma half, it is root pi. That will be a wrong uh, assertion. You have to give me a, a precise explanation as to why does it converge, right. Discuss the convergence of integral minus infinity to infinity cos a x d x upon x squared plus b squared. That is the next one. Then the last problem in this page, which means that there is another page at least. Prove that integral 1 to infinity sin x upon root x converges conditionally. How do you do this? exactly what we did for sin x upon x. First, integrate by parts and prove the convergence. Then the second part is draw the arches for the sin function 
and look at what is happening. Imitate the argument for mod sin x upon x here again with sin x upon root x. If you, mod sin x upon root x integral from 0, 1 to infinity will diverge. It is a conditionally convergent integral. So, work out the uh, or go through the argument for sin x upon x again with this example in mind. Okay. Show that integral 1 to infinity sin of x squared is a conditionally convergent integral. How? Sin of x squared dx from 1 to infinity is conditionally convergent. How? No, comparison test is only true for absolute convergence. Comparison test is a test for absolute convergence. For conditional convergence is delicate. Exactly, substitute for x squared, put x squared equal to t and reduce it to the previous one. Reduce it to the previous one, correct? All right, okay. Well, well, well. More problems? More generally, discuss the convergence of 1 to infinity sin of x to the power a dx, where a is positive. Sin of x to the power a. The next problem is discuss the convergence of integral 1 to infinity sin pi x upon log x. This is interesting. This integral is also interesting sin pi x upon log x and discuss the integral e to infinity cos pi x upon 2 e log log x. Okay. Log x is t, so d x upon x is d t. Mm -hmm. How does that help? Anyway, think about these things. I mean, and all of it is not entirely trivial. Some of it is tricky. Discuss the convergence of 2 to infinity integ uh, integral dx upon x into log x to the power a and integral 3 to infinity dx upon x log x log log x to the power a. Try, try these things, some of them are quite delicate. Last two are easy, exactly like the first one. Yeah. That sin pi x upon log x is delicate, correct? I mean, it is sort of, I mean, it is not, it's, problems should be of varying degrees, right? I mean, you cannot just all, all of them have some simple problems, you know, some 25 simple exercises. Some of them, you know, you have to think, you have to understand where the difficulty is. Sometimes, you may not even be able to do some of them easily with the, with the kind of uh, arsenal that you have at your disposal. So, I mean, what do we have at our disposal? Pretty much nothing. Only comparison test, that is all. How much can you do? I mean, just, I mean, particularly the sin pi x upon log x, 1 to infinity. I mean, just try to understand where the difficulty lies. The conditional, the, the fact that it cannot converge absolutely is easy. You will have to again repeat the same argument. But the convergence is not so simple. If you keep integrating by parts, okay, anyway, integrate by parts and see what you get. Let us see. Rather than, rather than speculate, why not just do the thing and see, right? Try it. It is well worth trying these exercises. All right. Shall we proceed? Is it clear what is improper integrals of the first kind? Have you taught these things? Is it just a review or is it all new? It is all new. Okay. Improper integrals of the second kind. Now, we shall only be concerned with functions defined on intervals i such that f is Riemann integrable over every sub interval a to b. See, I am not going to keep repeating this again and again. See, the I will tell you the problem. Suppose if f is less than g, let us take the comparison test mod f less than or equal to mod g, I am saying. Now, suppose for example, I take the function f and I start modifying it on the interval, let us say 1 to 2 and define it to be x if x is rational and 1 minus x is, if x is irrational and play such games. 
then mod f less than mod g that condition will not change and in mod g will be integrable and mod f may not be integrable right and you have difficulties of that kind f of x equal to 1 if x is rational, minus 1 if x is irrational, mod f is integrable, but f is not integrable. The issue here is not the problem of integrability in the sense of Riemann on bounded domains, that the function is oscillating too much. That is not the issue here. Issue here is just the growth conditions at infinity and, at, at sub, uh, and things like that. So, let us make it a blanket assumption that all functions under consideration are Riemann integrable over bounded closed bounded sub intervals. Suppose I am interested in the improper integral a to b, open interval a to b, the function is defined like 1 over root of x minus a, it is not defined, it is becoming infinite at a and it is becoming infinite at b, right. So, if I take the, if I, if I take a proper closed sub interval, let us say c to d, it is Riemann integrable on the sub interval. So, I am going to make this assumption. Uh, as I am going to assume that this is the case, that the function is becoming unbounded at isolated points and we are here concerned with growth properties of the function, the function is becoming unbounded at a, how, how fast is it becoming unbounded, that is where the issue is and we should concentrate our attention there, not on whether the function is x when x is rational and 1 minus x is irrational, that is not the issue here, that is a different issue. If you want to bring in all those things also, then they better not to do Riemann integration, better do Lebesgue integrals directly, finished. Ultimately, that is the ultimate weapon. So, here we are concerned, so we should not lose sight of our goals. Our goals are to understand the growth condition, the precise growth conditions of the function, the oscillatory behavior of the function, the internal cancellations that take place like sin x upon x, you know on it, it oscillates and when you integrate it from 1 to t sin x upon x, there are, there are internal cancellations taking place and moment I have to put, put the modulus sign, these cancellations are not taking place and the areas are adding up. So, that is where we have to focus our attention on. Okay. So, this is going to be the assumption that all functions under consideration will be integrable, will be Riemann integrable over the sub intervals. Uh, a to b of i. Is it clear? Okay. So, specifically let us work with inter intervals of the form alpha open in at alpha and closed at beta, closed at alpha open at beta or open intervals alpha beta that will come to uh, that will come next. So, for the second kind it will be open alpha closed beta or closed alpha open beta correct. And the in the case of open alpha closed beta the function will may become unbounded at alpha or in the case of closed alpha open beta, the function can become unbounded at beta, all right. So, so in the first case, the function may be unbounded on uh, alpha, alpha plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than 0. In the second case, uh, it will become unbounded on beta minus delta beta for every delta bigger than 0. So, this is the setup. So, then we have such a function. So, let us let us just focus our attention on open alpha closed beta, the other, other case is parallel. So, now we want to define integral alpha to beta f t d t. How do you do that? Limit as epsilon goes to 0, integral alpha plus epsilon to beta f t d t, that is a natural definition. The limit exists, we would say that the improper integral converges, the limit does not exist, we will say it diverges if integral of mo the modulus converges, we will say it is absolutely convergent. One can formulate a Cauchy's principle of convergence, correct, for these kinds of integrals and then one can talk about absolute and conditional convergence and so on, correct. So, I will leave it to you to write down the appropriate definitions, write down, formulate a Cauchy criterion for these kinds of improper integrals and prove it also. The proofs are just modifications of the previous uh, proofs of the previous case, correct. Okay. And then one can also prove a Cauchy criterion, one can also then one will have a comparison test. You, just as you have a comparison test for improper integrals of the first kind, you can have a 
rest of the improper integrals of second kind. F and G are two functions and G dominates F, G dominates F and the dominant one integral alpha to beta mod G T D T converges implies integral alpha to beta mod F T D T also converges and the second one is basically the contraposition of the first one. Second statement is basically the same as the first statement is written in contrapositive form, but it is convenient to spell it out, it is useful to spell it out. Likewise, there is a limit comparison test. This time you are taking two functions f and g and you are taking limit as t tends to alpha because alpha is a troublesome point. Interval is finite, but the functions are becoming unbounded. Take the, take the ratio, take the limit the limit exists and is not 0, then the two integrals behave alike mod f mod f integral of mod f and integral of mod g both converge or both diverge. Proof is also same as the previous one. So, the case when f is unbounded in the neighborhood of beta is similar the closed uh, the interval is clo closed on the left and open on the right that case is parallel to the previous case and so that can be completely left for you. Now, suppose the function is unbounded at alpha and beta 1 over root of x into 1 minus x open interval 0 1 take the open interval 0 1 look at 1 over square root of x into 1 minus x function is unbounded at 0 and at 1. Then how will you define the integral from 0 to 1 dx upon root of x into 1 minus x? Take some arbitrary intermediate point gamma and then integral from alpha to beta of f is integral from alpha to gamma of f plus integral from gamma to beta. The requirement is that both should be finite. Similarly, one can generalize it you could have a function defined let us say on the whole real line, but becoming unbounded at finitely many points a 1, a 2, a 3, a 4, a 5. Then what do I do? Then to say that the improper integral minus infinity to infinity f t d t exists means minus infinity to a 1 that integral should exist that is an improper integral of the first kind. Then integral from a 1 to a 2 we have just discussed what that means integral from a 2 to a 3 integral from a 3 to a 4 integral from a 4 to a 5 and integral from a 5 to a infinity sorry integral from a 5 to infinity each of these pieces must exist independently and then the integral you simply add up the integrals correct that is the that is what is written down integral a to infinity is by definition integral from a to a 1 plus a 1 to a 2 plus etcetera and only I am looking only finitely many points. Of course, the next question one can ask is what about infinitely many points there exist functions right which become unbounded at infinitely many points cortex right? tan x cortex secant x cosecant x they become infinite at several of the points simultaneously I mean right all of them. You can also think of cases where these uh, it becomes infinite at several points and these points have a limit point. So, function can become infinite at half, one third, one fourth etcetera. I can easily construct examples one can construct examples of functions which become infinite at every rational number in the neighborhood of every rational correct. But we are not going to be concerned with these exotic examples. We will only be concerned with cases where there are there could be infinitely many discontinued uh, points at which the function becomes infinite, but these are spread like Typical examples are cortex, tan x, secant x, e to the power minus x squared into cortex, 
such things. So, for example, I could give you the, I could ask you e to the power minus x squared root tan x. So, let us just look at, I will just uh, uh, skip these things. For example, let us look at this example integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus t root tan t dt. Discuss, discuss this integral. Where are the, where are the, where are the points of, where are the troublesome points? pi by 2, 3 pi by 2, 5 pi by 2, minus pi by 2, minus 3 pi by 2, minus 5 pi by 2. So, what will be a reasonable definition of this, such integrals? You just assume that each piece, pi by 2 to 3 pi by 2, the thing should converge and let us just stick to absolute convergence. I mean, one can, you know, conditional convergence also one can do. Most of the examples will be of this kind, all right. So, I will leave it to you to formulate the appropriate definitions. One can even have infinitely many points at which the function becomes unbounded, but we are not going to be concerned with examples where every rational number is a troublesome point. Our concern will be with functions of this kind e to the power minus t root tan t and, and the like I mean, and combinations thereof. I mean, right. So, let us just stick to this and this is enough, this is complex enough for the present you know, course. Right. Because when you have those kinds of things, you know, every rational, the best thing is to you know, appeal to Lebesgue theory. When the function becomes really ugly at too many points, then things get messier and messier. I mean, better to simply appeal to Lebesgue theory. There is no such thing as an improper Lebesgue integral. There is only Lebesgue integrals that is it, finished. No question of that, that theory is much cleaner in, in some sense. Yes, more exercises. Discuss the convergence of the integrals 0 to pi log sin x, 0 to pi by 2 root tan x, 0 to 1 t to the power a minus 1, 1 minus t to the power b minus 1. How will you do root tan x for Or first let us take log sin x. How will you do log sin x? What about log x? Can you can everybody do log x integral 0 to pi by 2 log x? You directly integrate and you directly check that integral 0 to pi log x dx converges or diverges? It converges, correct. So, lo, integral of 0 to pi log x dx converges. Correct. It in fact converges absolutely. Now, how do you can you compare log sin x and log x? Where is the trouble for sin x? 0 and pi. So, at 0, sin x is behaving like x. So, can you compare log sin x and log x and study what happens to see you have to you have to break up the integral, no? 0 to pi by 2 and pi by 2 to pi. You have to break it up. On 0, let us first look at 0 to pi by 2 log sin x and you can you can come can you compare it with log x can you write log sin x as log of sin x upon x plus log x log sin x equal to log of sin x upon x plus log x log x we are just finished discussing sin x upon x is a continuous function on 0 to pi by 2 and 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 uh, sin x upon x is 1 at x equal to 0 and so log sin x by log of sin x upon x is continuous it's a proper riemann integral so can you please do that think about the others also use comparison test find the value of 0 to infinity e to the power minus x squared you already told me the answer root pi by 2 and then the other one is also given to you integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus a x squared minus e to the power minus b x squared upon x squared dx integrate by parts for this integrate by parts. Integrate by parts. What about the last integral in the, in the display? integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus a x minus 
uh, e to the power minus b x upon x dx. The last one, this one, have you seen this one? Hmm? Seems vaguely familiar, right? It is useful in gamma functions, but hmm? it cannot be reduced to a gamma integral, but it is useful in certain problems involving gamma functions. It is called the Frulani integral, it is called the Frulani integral, Frulani integral. Its value is log b by its value is log of b by well it is one one can reduce it to a laplace one can reduce it to the study of laplace transforms yes which one ha huh, the second one is the beta function that's correct absolutely correct some of these examples are probably familiar to you, beta function root tan x will be familiar to you, how to compute the value also, but this Frulani integral seems to be new, you do, you do, it does not look like you have seen it somewhere, e to the power minus x squared is familiar to you. I am sure log sin x also you are done, the value, answer is minus pi log 2 but that is a different matter, computing the answer uh, value is a different matter altogether, but, uh, right. So, now you have a larger store of ex exercises for your students, right. Oh, you want to, you want to write still some more, which one, the last one, integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus a x minus e to the power minus b x upon x dx, yeah. So, okay, uh, what is the relationship between convergence of an improper integral and convergence of infinite series? Is there any theorem which will enable you to pass from one to the other? There is an integral test for convergence, right? That is correct. What does the integral test say? If you have a monotone decreasing function which is not a positive, then integral 1 to infinity f t d t and sigma f n, n from 1 to infinity behave alike, both converge or both diverge. Well, have fun, there are some more exercises. <laughs> that is the last one, you see that integral test. improper integral test. You see the point is why do not you just uh, like uh, up until now we have been doing ODs, it has been just methods, we have been doing standard examples and that you have been writing down, sample problems and so then I have been giving you exercises. So, work out the exercises looking at the sample problems and what we have done. And then there is a tutorial class, we can always discuss, uh, go over the material again in the tutorial class. So, that why do not you just focus on that. Now, okay, let us take today's class. Now, you understand what is an improper integral, right? You understand what is convergence, what is divergence, what is comparison test, absolute con con convergence, conditional convergence, concepts you understood and you, you have seen a few examples, sin x upon x and all. And now, you have these exercises. Why do not you just do these exercises? Uh, as it is without having to consult any material. You do not need any material to try these exercises, root tan x. You do not need anything to understand the convergence or divergence at pi by 2. You have to compare it with what? No beta function, we are not done beta functions. that is the point. When you do not have anything, you have only the definition, then it is easy. You do not have to consult anything because you just have the definitions at your, at your disposal. So, try to do the problems with what we have covered, 
I mean, I'm sure that you know integral of e to the power minus x square dx is gamma half. But you don't need all that stuff. So that's exactly why I don't want to give you the material, because I want you to do the problems based on what you have heard in the class. You simply pay attention to what I'm doing in the class. Come to the class, pay attention to what I'm doing in the class, work out the sample exercises. Jot down a few points here and there, and then use just this to work out these exercises. Try it out. Why not at least try? Why is it? Why is it that I should give you 400 pages of written material, uh, typed material, at right at the beginning of the course? If something is not clear, the afternoon tutorial is always an option for you to to ask a question. You can always say, "Could you please go over this material again?" And I'll be happy to go over the material again. That's up to you to ask. Professor, please discuss method of variation of parameters all over again. I'll be happy to do it. But I don't want to give the written material because I simply don't want you to consult back and forth. There are just very few formulas that are involved. The Abel-Lewell formula. I mean, it doesn't take too much time to jot down that single formula from the uh, from the slide, all right? Use of a known solution. Just write the formula. That's all that you really need. That you might forget. You might forget a minus sign. So just jot down just that formula and try to use it. And you pay attention to what's going on in the class. Look at the solved example. Every theory, every piece of theory is being illustrated with at least one solved example. So here I am telling you integrate by parts. So uh, go over and integrate by parts and see what you get. See, mathematics can be learnt only by doing, not by consulting n number of books. This is the improper integral test is difficult. I mean, I don't expect you to come up with a uh, answer unless you have seen it, or you can probably think of it graphically. You can draw some graphs, try to come up uh, with some ideas, so that when you discuss it in the tutorial class, you will. You will be well equipped. So now let us do one more little piece before quitting improper integrals, namely the rule for differentiating under the integral sign. We already discussed this uh, in the tutorial class yesterday in detail, but this time let us consider the case of an improper integral, possibly improper integral, right? So suppose you have a function of two variables. What is the setup? Integral of f of x comma t dt. So you are integrating with respect to t over a certain interval j. What do you get? You get is a what you get is a function of x defined on the interval i, and you want to understand the differentiability properties of this. Correct. So that's what is written down. So for you have a function f from i cross j to r, the function of two variables, and you are integrating f integral of f of x t dt over j. What it is, is a function of x which you are differentiating with respect to x. But what would you like to do? You would like to take this d dx inside the integral. Yeah, the, the limits of j, j is a, a fixed constant, it is a rectangle, i is an interval and j is an interval. i can be considered as an interval a b and j is an interval c d. A could be infinite, A could be minus infinity and B could be plus infinity. That is the point. This, this J could be a open interval. This integral here is an improper integral in general. That is the whole point. And so you want to prove a formula of this kind. Under what conditions will this formula be true? That is what you want. Correct? You would like to have this in your toolkit. You want to know when is it justified to take the d dx inside the integral sign. It cannot always be done. You simply cannot differentiate that under the integral sign. You need to justify that step. So I am going to state one theorem and that theorem is here. This you can probably jot down. Assume that del f by del x is continuous. Of course, the function should be differentiable of course. Del f by del x should exist. I mean, uh, that is a natural hypothesis and 
I am going to assume that del f by del x is continuous with respect to x, f is continuous, uh, yeah, continuous with respect to, assume that del f by del x is continuous with respect to x and t, excuse me, with respect to x and t, just let us just make it with respect to x and t, sorry, excuse me, yeah, assume that del f by del x is continuous with respect to x and t, correct and dominated by g t and dominated by g t. That is what is the meaning of that? That is mod of del f by del x at x t is less than or equal to g t for all x t in i cross g. The third condition is that integral g t d t over j converges. Then the result d d x integral f of x t d t over j equal to integral over j of del f by del x t d t holds. This is all that you really need for applications. Is it clear? What is the theorem saying? You are given a function of two variables x and t, correct? del f by del x exists. I am going to assume that del f by del x is continuous in both variables x and t, right. And mod of del f by del x x comma t is less than or equal to g t everywhere. And integral of g t is finite that is integral of g t d t uh, g t d t over j is a convergent integral. Then the then you can differentiate under the integral sign. Uh, rather than prove this in the context of improper Riemann integrals, it is best to leave it uh, unproved now. When you study Lebesgue theory, this will be one of the standard applications of the dominated convergence theorem. We can discuss how the proof goes in the tutorial class if you are interested. Just briefly, the, the gist of the proof I can explain to you in the tutorial class. I can explain to you what the dominated convergence theorem is trying to say in Lebesgue theory and we can do that, that much we can do. But ultimately, it is best to leave it for the Lebesgue integration case. Okay. Is this clear? Theorem is easy to apply, conditions are fairly easy to check, right? del f by del x should exist, it should be continuous, I mean what more could be natural. Only peculiar thing is that, that, that the partial derivative should be dominated by g t, that condition is somewhat peculiar, but we can always verify that in many contexts. So, after stating this theorem, I think it is time for a application, calculate integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus a x squared cos of x psi d x. Use the fact that integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus x squared d x is root pi by 2. This is a very important example. This is an extremely important example and a very one of the it, it ranks among the most important examples in the whole course and the reason why it is so important will appear in the next slide. Towards the end of the next slide, I will tell you why it is so important. Cause of x xi, xi is a variable, real variable. <coughs> okay, let us call the integral i of psi, integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus a x squared cos x xi dx, let us call it uh, I of psi. The previous theorem is clearly applicable because you can differentiate because del f by del the partial derivative with respect to psi certainly exists. When you differentiate a cosine, you are going to get a sine and an x is going to come out of it and put the absolute value and use the fact that the sine function is less than or equal to 1. What are you going to get? What is your g function? x e to the power minus x squared. Is it convergent integral from minus infinity to infinity x e to the power minus x squared mod 
previous theorem is applicable, no problem. So, you can differentiate under the integral sign. So, when you differentiate under the integral sign, what do you get? I prime of psi equal to minus 0 to infinity, you pick up a minus sign from the cosine, differentiating the cosine e to the power minus a x squared x sin x psi. But the x and the e to the power minus a x squared can be combined in uh, as a derivative and written as a derivative of e to the power minus a x squared. Now, integrate by parts, what do you get? The, del, the d d x goes over from here to there and the minus sign goes away. So, what are you left with? 1 over 2 a integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus a x squared del del x of sin of x psi. What am I going to do next? What is the next step? What is the next step? Carry out the differentiation, no? What are you going to get? Psi cosine x psi and we are integrating with respect to x. So, psi can come out, psi can come out and what do you get as a result? I prime of psi equal to psi over 2 a into i psi, which is a linear first order ODE. Integrate it. Yes, no, just now. <laughs> Integrate it just now. And there is a constant of integration which we will have to determine at the end of the day. I do not want to show you the whole slide. Yes. So, i prime psi is psi upon 2 a i of psi, correct? Integrating this O d, what are you going to get? i of psi equal to c e to the power minus psi squared upon 4 a, correct? Next, put psi equal to 0, i of 0 is c. But the other hand, what is i of 0 directly from the, in, from the integral itself? Cos of 0, no? x psi, put psi equal to the cos of 0 is 1. So, you simply get i of 0 equal to 0 to infinity e to the power minus a x square d x, which is root pi by 4 a, correct? So, the constant has been computed and i of psi equal to root pi by 4 a e to the power minus psi squared by 4 a. So, why is it such an important result? Why is this result so important? What have we calculated now? We have calculated the, the Fourier transform of e to the power minus a x squared. We have computed explicitly the Fourier transform of e to the power minus a x squared. You have computed the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. The Fourier transform of a Gaussian is another Gaussian. So, if I adjust a properly, then the Fourier transform will just be a multiple of itself. If I, all that I have to do is to adjust a properly. Suppose I take a equal to half. Suppose I take a equal to half, then what do you get? Then you get e to the power minus x squared by 2 on the Fourier transform of e to the power minus x squared by 2 is root 2 pi times the uh, e to the power minus psi squared by 2. So, root 2 pi is a eigenvalue of the Fourier transform. Fourier transform is a linear, linear transformation. It means eigenvalue is root 2 pi. Exceedingly important result. So, this completes the 
our discussion of improper integrals. Now, we turn to a special function namely the gamma function. The gamma function is a very old function. You know how many years old it is? You know how old is the gamma function? It is 280 years old. It was introduced by Euler in the year 1729 in a letter to Goldbach. Let us see what it, let us see the historical details a little more carefully. The function was introduced by Euler in 1729. It originated in his attempt to interpolate the factorial and appears first in 1729 in a letter written by him to Goldbach. Goldbach. The principal contributors to the study of the gamma function is given, a brief list is given to you here. And this list consists of only those people who have done some spectacular work. Okay. Legendre, the old, after Euler, of course, Euler was, was the guy who introduced it. After Euler, the most important name that appears is Legendre. He is the one who gave it the, who used the notation gamma of A, and he called it the gamma function. Then Gauss wrote his great memoir on hypergeometric series in 1812, a, a remarkable piece of work. In this piece of work, he derives all the properties of the gamma function that were known at that time as byproducts of his general investigations on the hypergeometric series. And this part that deals with gamma function is a very small part, about 10 to 15 pages of a long memoir. The memoir itself is quite long and a small chunk of it is devoted to the gamma function, a section, a few couple of sections, a few sections. And in these few sections, he gets the entire theory of gamma function, the known, he summarizes the whole thing, all the known results are obtained as corollaries of the remarkable results on hypergeometric series that he proved, that he establishes in this paper. And he also considered the gamma function of a, as a function of a complex variable. Then comes of course, Weierstrass, the function theoretic viewpoint. Alfred Pringsheim wrote a very long memoir on the gamma function. Pringsheim was the father-in-law of the great German poet Thomas Mann. Then there is the names of Binet, Hankel. Hankel was a student of Weierstrass. In fact, um, other names can also be included here. For example, Richard Dedekind, for instance. He was a student of Gauss. He was the last student of Gauss. He wrote his thesis on the gamma function. Hankel also wrote his thesis under Weierstrass on the gamma function. And then in 1922, two Danish mathematicians, Bohr and Mollerup. Then comes the name of Villand, Helmut Villand. Have you heard Villand's name? In what, in what context? In the context of group theory. Villand was a very great group theorist. His contributions in group theory and matrix analysis are well known, remarkable contributions to uh, in algebra. So, but the, his work on, he wrote, proved one theorem on the gamma function, which went into obscurity until Rem, Remert brought it into prominence in 1996. Then recently, the theorem of Villant was sharpened by Bent Fugled in the year 2008. So, you see that this theorem, this function which is 280 years old continues to, in, to interest mathematicians of this day. Almost every mathematician has, uh, every great mathematician has 
contributed to this function. I told you besides this list, there is a there are a number of other uh, people. I mean the list would be rather long if I were to include everybody's name. Richard Dedekind has contributed, Dirichlet has contributed for instance to the study of this function, Jacobi has contributed to this function, Ernst Kummer has contributed to this function, a big list. One can go on, one can compile a very long bibliography and such a long bibliography has been compiled by um, Niels Nielsen in 1905. This was before Bohr, Moller up and uh, Villant. You can, if you are interested in the historical details, you can consult my paper in the American Mathematical Monthly, which appeared in April 2007, volume 114, it is a 19 page article, 297 to 315 and you will see the original references in the original papers and the Gaussian approach is uh, sketched in section 4 of this paper. So, okay, so for what is the definition of the gamma function? For a bigger than 0, the improper integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus t, t to the power a minus 1 converges and the value is denoted by gamma of a and a simple integration by parts would convince you that gamma of a plus 1 is a gamma a and directly putting a equal to 1 in the integral will immediately give you gamma of 1 equal to 1 these two properties are immediate from the definition itself, correct. Now, suppose I allow the a to be a complex number, then what do I do? Let us discuss absolute convergence of the integral, take absolute values e to the power minus t, t to the power a minus 1, what is the absolute value of t to the power a minus 1? you have to go back to the definition of t to the power a. What is the definition of t to the power a? Exponential of a log t and so if I take the absolute value, so what is absolute value of e to the power z when z is a complex number? It is e to the power x, correct? Absolute value of e to the power z is e to the power real part of z. So like so, likewise absolute value of t to the power a minus 1 will be t to the power real part of a minus 1. So, the integral will converge if a is in the right half plane. If a is in the right half plane, the integral will still converge and it will define an analytic function. So, the integral defines an analytic function on the right half plane, okay. that is the first thing that you notice. So, you have an analytic function of the right half plane that satisfies the properties gamma of a plus 1 is a gamma a and gamma of 1 equal to 1. What else did you uh, did, did you say you know about the gamma function? Gamma of half equal to root pi, here is it, something that is familiar to many of you. And then gamma of 3 by 2 will be? half gamma half because gamma of a plus 1 is a gamma a. So, gamma 3 by 2 is half gamma half that is root pi by 2. Similarly, gamma 5 by 2 we can calculate, gamma 7 by 2 we can calculate and gamma n will be gamma n is what n minus 1 factorial. So, the gamma function is known at the integers and half integers that is all. that is all that you can do explicitly. Gamma one third, what is the value? Gamma two thirds, what is the value? No, we do not know. Okay. Hmm? It is like just as you do not know what is sin 1, right? You know sin pi by 4, 1 over root 2 and you know sin pi by 6 is half, but you do not know sin 1 like that. I mean. And you work with the sign function, right? Now, the functional equation. Now, there are lots of things in the slide. You do not have to write anything. You do not need any of these things. The question that will now arise is that to what extent does the functional equation characterize the gamma function? 
Now, suppose you look at the exponential function e to the power x, it satisfies the functional equation f of x plus y equal to f x into f y. Now, you put a normalizing condition f of 1 equal to e or something like that, then that fixes it completely, correct. Any continuous function f which satisfies f of x plus y equal to f of x into f of y should be e to the power c x and moment you put f of 1 equal to 1, it is c is 1, it is simply e to the power x only. In other words, the functional equation plus a normalizing condition characterizes the exponential function e to the power x, correct. Question that we want to ask is, suppose I take a function f of x such that f of x plus 1 equal to x times f of x and f of 1 equal to 1. Does it follow that f of x equal to gamma x? No. Unfortunately, that is not the case. The functional equation with the no normalization f of 1 equal to 1 does not characterize uniquely the gamma function simply because if I take the gamma function gamma x and multiply it by cos 2 pi x, that will also satisfy the functional equation, that will also satisfy the normalization. And instead of cos 2 pi x, you could take sin, you, ca you cannot take sin 2 pi x because if you take sin 2 pi x, then the normalization will fail, right. You could take any 2 pi periodic function with, uh, with uh, you know, the 2 pi periodic c infinity function which takes the value 1, uh, one right, phi of, phi of 1 will be 1 such that phi of 1 will be 1, that will also do it, correct. So, it is clearly not unique, it is highly non-unique. So, question arises, what further conditions are required so that you will recover the gamma function only, you should get the gamma function only. You want of course, f of x plus 1 equal to x f x, f of 1 equal to 1 plus some more condition on f what is the nice condition on f that will give you the gamma function. This was a question that had engaged the attention of many mathematicians. In fact, Hankel seriously worked with this problem and he was looking for a function theoretic characterization and he did not succeed in finding a proper, uh, he was not happy with the kind of characterization he had found, something intrinsic. In the year 1922, the Danish mathematicians Bohr and Mollerup, they succeeded in finding the additional condition that will single out the gamma function from the functional equation. And now, before I explain to you what Bohr and Mollerup are trying to do, let us recall a few basic things about convex functions. Once again, this is there in every book. The definition of a convex function is there in Rudin. You do not have to write it down. What is the, when is the function said to be convex? If the graph, the, the A region lying above the graph is a convex set, then the chord must always lie above the graph. In other words, analytically that means f of lambda x plus mu y should be less than or equal to lambda f x plus mu f of y. This is the meaning of convex functions, right. Exponential function, is it convex? It is convex. x squared is convex, right. x to the power 4 is convex. If you take two derivatives, you get x squared multiple of x squared, right? It is convex on the whole real line. So, now let us look at this. Log x is a concave function, minus log x is convex. The graph is like this. Now, it is very easy to see that if phi is convex, then e to the power phi is also convex. That is obvious. So, in some sense e to the power phi is more convex than phi, 
what do you mean by more convex? Let us not try to quantify it, just we are trying to uh, formulate a certain definition, we are, we are heading towards a certain definition, we are heading towards understanding a certain concept. Now, x squared is convex. Suppose I take the log of x squared, what do I get? 2 log x, it is not convex. x to the power 4 is convex, but the moment I take the logarithm, it is not going to be. Take any power of x, however high it is. See, as you increase the powers, it becomes more and more convex, right? So, if you take whatever be the power you take, x to the power 8, x to the power 16, you take the log, convexity is destroyed. But if you take e to the power x and take its log, you get x, it is still convex. It is a line, log of e to the power x is x, it is a straight line, it just makes it. Question is if you take phi which is convex, will log phi be convex? It is not true, but it is true for exponential function, it just about manages to retain its convexity after taking a log. So, a function has to be highly convex. So, as to retain its convexity after the well, log is trying to bend it, it is trying to destroy the convexity, correct. So, that is what we are should be looking at. So, exponential function e to the power x barely manages to retain its convexity after taking log. e to the power x squared does better. After taking log, it remains convex and it remains nicely convex, it's strictly convex. But x is not strictly convex, it is convex but not strict, it is a straight, it is it's flat, right. So, this is the thing. Now, let us show that exercise, show that log cosh x is convex, cosh x is convex, look at the graph, cosh x is convex or take the second derivative, second derivative of cosh x is again cosh x, it's convex. But if you take the log of cosh x, it is still convex. So, cosh x manages to retain its convexity after taking log. What about log secant x? What is the first derivative of log secant x? Tan x, tan x. Log secant x, the derivative is tan x. Second derivative, secant squared x. This is positive on the interval minus pi by 2 to pi by 2. So, log secant x is convex. So, a function f from i to r is said to be log convex if log of f of x is convex. Of course, log convexity will imply convexity, no, because if log of f of x is convex, then e to the power log f of, f of x is convex. In other words, f of x is convex. So, log convexity is much more than convexity. You know, it is not just enough that f should be convex, log f should be convex. So, two examples I have already given you, several examples rather, e to the power x is log convex, e to the power x squared is log convex, log uh, cosh x is log convex and secant x is log convex on the respective domains, correct. Now, we are ready to state the bohr muller up theorem. Right? Exercise show that gamma a is convex. This is easy. Convexity of the gamma function is easy because you can differentiate under the integral sign. We have we have discussed the conditions under which it can be done. Differentiate under the integral sign twice, and you can check that gamma a is convex. It requires more work to check that gamma a is log convex because log convexity is much more than convexity. But we shall see that later. We will prove later that gamma function is log convex. So, one more example of a log convex function for you, this is gamma function. Bohr and Mollerup proved that if you have a function f of x, now I think please listen to what I got to say, do not look at the slide. If you take a function f of x, which satisfies the functional equation, and which satisfies the condition f of 1 equal to 1, then we have seen it is not the necessarily the gamma function. What is the additional condition that is required? f should be log convex. Put in this extra condition and immediately you get the characterization. 
this is the theorem of Bohr and Mollerer. What about the proof? Look up Rudin, Principles of Mathematical Analysis. Is the book familiar to you? Principles of Mathematical Analysis by Walter Rudin, chapter 8 of the book, third edition. Look at the edition, a third edition contains the proof of the Bohr Mollerer theorem. Very elegantly written. Rudin contains a section on gamma function, a very elegantly written section. You will also see the proof in Quran Fritz John, which we talked about yesterday. Introduction to Calculus and Analysis, Volume 1. There is a section on, there is a chapter on gamma functions, and he will prove, I think he proves the Bohr Muller theorem in that. So, I have given you these references for the Bohr Muller theorem. Now, what we want is a different type of characterization, which I told you that Hankel was looking for a characterization. Hankel was looking for a function theoretic characterization, a complex analysis type of a condition. Log convexity is pretty much a real thing. You are talking about convexity. Convexity is, well, when is a function set to be con the second derivative is positive. These are all a re a real uh, in the real domain. Right? If you take a complex valued function, you can't talk about inequalities. No? So, the log convexity is a real characterization in the real domain. What about the characterization in the complex domain? You want such a function theoretic characterization. This function theoretic characterization was discovered by Villant in 1939. What the uh, what was what these people who have been looking in the 19th century, Hankel and others a complete solution was given, a very elegant answer was given by Villant, Helmut Villant, the group theorist. And um, this uh, was first brought into prominence by Remert in 1996. If you look at the monthly paper, which I talked about, you will see the reference to Rem Remert and other things. You will see a comp comprehensive bibliography in my paper. You can look at the citations in my paper. Let us know. So, I will pass on that and I will just state for you the theorem of Villant. Villant's theorem is very easy to state. Of course, you need the two conditions f of z plus 1 is z f z, f of 1 is 1 and we are going to be working in the right half plane. In the, the bohr muller theorem, we work in, work in the positive real line. This time, it is a complex valued function of a complex variable. We are looking at the right half plane. So, you are looking at a analytic function in the right half plane, which satisfies f of z plus 1 is z f z, f of 1 is 1 and the additional condition is that the function mod function mod of f should be bounded in a vertical strip of width 1. Here it is, here is the picture in a vertical strip of width 1, say 1 less than real part of z less than 2. That is a vertical strip of width 1. In that st vertical strip, mod f z should be bounded. Very simple to state. The condition of Villant is very simple in its nature. It just asserts the boundedness of the mod f on the vertical strip. So, if these three conditions are satisfied, then f of z equal to gamma z. I think it is a very elegant theorem on the gamma function. Proof is not difficult. It uses the theory of functions of a complex variable. The Liouville's theorem is required. And again, you can see the reference of Rem, uh, to Remert's paper. It is there. Okay. Tomorrow we shall see an application. The first thing we'll do is we'll see an application of Villant's theorem, and then we'll go on further. Tomorrow also, I will continue with the discussion of the gamma function, beta function, and everything. And we will close this section on special functions, and then after that we will take up. Laplace transforms. And so tomorrow's lecture we will continue with the gamma function. All right, thank you very much. That completes today's class, and we will meet in the afternoon. 
and we will discuss the problems on improper integrals.